All right, so welcome back. So today we're taking a look at uh, the Battle of Agen Agincourt, 1415, so part two for me. So click up there if you missed for part one. Um, it's very vital that you go watch that because it'll help build the context here. Otherwise, the original video is in the description. Go watch that um, if you don't want it to be, probably make this over 40-something minutes because I like to hear myself talk. All right, so with that, let's get to it. With the formid formidable town of Harfleur now under English control, King Henry faced a dilemma. His strategic goal were the urban centers and fortifications of northern France, which, once conquered, would serve as bases from where his troops and administrators could subjugate and tax the surrounding countryside to pay off the war effort. This plan gained widespread support from the people and the magnates, and large sums were borrowed to finance the campaign, in part through parliamentary taxation. But the siege of Harfleur proved costly. The English army was worn down by casualties and disease, and winter was just around the corner. Worse, reports came of French forces being assembled near Rouen. It was clear that Henry's ambitious plans had to be put on hold. At a council meeting, the king was advised to garrison Harfleur and sail back to England so his troops could recover. But Henry knew that conquering the principal North French port alone would not produce a sense of victory and authority he needed to secure his position at home, nor would it cover the vast borrowings for the campaign. Because again, last part, he was offered a ridiculous amount of money to not do this and also get the French king's daughter and all the freaking Agen, uh, sorry, Aquitaine and all that. But again, he didn't do that because, you know, wants to. I mean, with that amount of money, you could have really, literally put all of your nobles down and then done whatever. But, um, yeah, so he wanted to invade and he had to fuck up an astronomical amount of money because, again, raising an English army takes an incredible amount of army that you have to pay for these guys, right? So he's kind of out of money. Um, so he needs to get more. So more towns need to be burned. More uh, villages need to be sacked. Ignoring his counselors, Henry led his forces out of Harfleur, planning a swift mounted march to Calais. He sent orders to Governor William Bardolph to ride to the Somme estuary and secure the crossing point for the incoming English army. Now you may ask why Calais? Well, actually it was under, um, the British held it forever, or sorry, not the British, the, uh, <laughs> England held it forever. Um, it was like a, it was a very valuable port because a lot of, think about this, a lot of sheep wool came through it, if I remember correctly, because sheep wool was very valuable back then. Um, and that was like the port to Europe uh, from the English side. So it was very valuable port just in general. And the British owned it. So they have a technically force in France, along with all the other stuff, right? So now they have Harfleur Calais. So now the, the governor can meet him at Cressy. Should sound familiar. <laughs> Henry's advisors argued that sailing through the channel would be safer. But the king wanted to demonstrate that he could pillage northern France with impunity, lands that he claimed were his. However, upon learning of Henry's departure from Harfleur, the Constable of France, Charles d'Albret, went after him. He urged local nobles to mobilize their retinues and help contain the invaders west of the Somme, where he planned to trap and destroy them. Three days into the march, the English reached the river, but there was no sign of Bardolf and his host. Instead, French forces blocked the river crossing. Henry's plan for a fast campaign had backfired. With the French gathering, the English king was forced to lead his army upstream to avoid being surrounded. But Charles placed his forces well. Fords and bridges were either heavily guarded or destroyed. Knowing that Henry would have to move along the Somme, the Constable of France advanced with the main body towards the flat plains near Peron, intending to intercept and give battle to the invaders. 
and all of this makes sense from his side, right? And there's a lot of stuff you could do to the Prelude of uh, Battle of Agincourt, where he, King Henry's. All, there's a lot of maneuvering actually going on here, um, but he has engineers, which he will probably use somehow. French sorties were sent to harass and soften up the English column. But then, inexplicably, Henry moved away from the river, heading southeast. It has been suggested that during one of the sorties, some of the French soldiers were captured and interrogated. If intelligence was indeed gathered that Charles was waiting near Peron, it would explain Henry's subsequent move southeast to avoid the trap. Far away from Calais and safety, English troops were dejected by rumors of a possible battle, concerned that they would be easily cornered and overwhelmed near the river. Then, at last, 11 days into the march, scouts found an unguarded ford. Once across the Somme, Henry moved around the French position at Peron. I believe his engineers actually had to get in the water and build bridges, because again, just because you can technically ford it with horses and, you know, people doesn't mean the wagons and everyone else and the camp servants and the wives and the merchants and everyone else <laughs> uh, can make it across, I believe. But you can correct me if I'm wrong in the comments there. The journey, however, turned from a fast 230 kilometer march along the coast into a 426 kilometer trek across France. The troops were tired, hungry, and sick. And just when he thought that he had evaded the enemy, French heralds brought an ominous letter. In it, Charla informed Henry that they would do battle before he reached Calais. The king promptly force-marched his army northwest, cutting straight towards Calais in the hope of outrunning the French. But then, scouts rode back at speed with alarming news. Having learned that the English forded the Somme, the Constable of France departed from Peron on the same day, successfully overtaking Henry, and was now blocking his line of march near the castle of Agincourt. The English were cut off from Calais. So the Constable actually outmaneuvered you know, King Henry here, uh, but we'll keep going before I talk about him. With no major action taking place on the first day, the two armies settled in for the night. In the French camp, meals were served and men yelled out for their servants, pages and friends, with the noise reaching the English. Some music, played to keep the spirits up, and loud boasting between soldiers at dinner was not unusual, especially on the eve of battle. But, in stark contrast across the field, Henry instilled absolute discipline ordering the troops to maintain silence in the camp. He wanted his men to remain focused and be on their guard, fearing a possible surprise mounted attack by the French during the night. Insisting that his troops keep their guard up proved wise when a mounted French party of men-at-arms and archers suddenly appeared during the night. They came close enough for there to be a brief exchange of missiles. A few English archers were reportedly captured, but without the true element of surprise, the French contingent rode back. Heavy rain and cold weather created miserable conditions for the men camping out overnight, but the king kept touring the camp, encouraging the troops ahead of the battle. Next morning, on St. Crispin's Day, the French began deploying some time after first light, while... So, again, night raids don't usually happen um, in medieval battles, and the main reason is simple, is you can't see anything. If you, like, go, go out tonight, <laughs> in the middle of... <laughs> it's like, go out into the middle of the forest, or, like, plains, with no light anywhere besides the moon, and try and, like, you know, go find something, or go fight a battle, yeah. That's kind of why they didn't do it. And if you light a torch, well, guess what? Now, literally, everyone within a mile radius can see you and see what you're doing. So that's why a lot of these night actions didn't happen. Now, when they did happen and they were successful, they were absolutely devastating. But they had to be planned out way prior and 
it required a lot of stuff to go right for that to happen. While the English army left their tents well before dawn, as Henry wanted to be the first to deploy in an effort to show the enemy that his men were eager to fight. In the light of day, Henry was quick to realize that the dreadful rain from the night prior created an unexpected opportunity. The soil of the recently plowed fields, sown with winter cereals, was not the fine loam of the vineyards of France, but the thick clay of the Somme that retained much of the rainwater, turning the ground into a sticky quagmire. Which will come back uh, approximately, uh, oh wait, that's right, another 500 years after this battle. Yeah, 1915, and if you do 501, if I can do my math correctly, uh, that would be uh, the Battle of the Somme on the Calais mud. You can see how this is like, you know, a lot of people actually during the Battle of the Somme would contribute um, stuff to the Battle of Agincourt, or at least think of the correlations there. But yeah, the, the ground, and this will come up very, this is a very crucial aspect, the mud, the mud and the clayiness of the ground. It wasn't just like mud. No, it was like soft clay mud that sticks on you and doesn't come off. It was bad, which we'll get into in a bit. Aware that this would slow down any attack by cavalry or infantry, the king formed a defensive line, posting three divisions of dismounted men-at-arms in the center, with small groups of archers between each division, and two large contingents of longbowmen on each flank, in a concaved formation. Which is good, by the way, a division back then does not mean the same thing it does today. Division was just like a, a way to divide forces, like... That's a division, that's a division, that's a division. It's just a way to divide people, okay? Um, the king, that Netflix show, uh, I think shows this kind of semi-accurately. Although, now that I think about it, it's terrible. No, no, it doesn't. It's, maybe the formation for half a second is. But the, the king, the movie on Netflix, no. Not for Ash and Corey, no. But this is a solid formation because, again, um, if you think about it, if they have to come to your front, you know where they are, which means you can pepper them with arrows the entire time. And if the archers are on the sides, they can hit them in the sides. This is going to start coming up and be very important. The bowmen fixed sharpened stakes into the ground in front of them to disrupt the enemy's cavalry charge and impale their horses. 200 mounted archers were secretly sent through the wooded area on the flank with orders to wait for the signal. This was a risky maneuver, as contingents of both armies patrolled the area around the battlefield. Meanwhile, Charla and the French leadership deployed two lines of several thousand infantrymen and dismounted men-at-arms, placing archers and crossbowmen between the divisions, with contingents of cavalry on the flanks, while the third line was largely composed of mounted men-at-arms. A few chroniclers mention artillery pieces, but it appears those played no part in the battle. The size of the two armies is still hotly debated. Accounting for the losses at half floor and the garrison left to guard the town, Henry was left with around 6,000 troops for the campaign, comprised of around 1,000 men-at-arms and 5,000 archers. Meanwhile, the notion of a vast French army is out of context for medieval history. Prior to 1415 AD, the last time a French king was able to muster 15 to 16,000 men was in the 1380s, and these were drawn from the whole kingdom, while in 1415 AD, there was very little recruitment south of the Loire. And it's important to know that the 60,000 number is ridiculous. But the 20,000, again, is still hotly debated. And again, this is pointing out the fact that the largest armies were 15 to 16. But is roughly double, a minimum double the English, and maybe three times their size. But what you really need to know is they were outnumbered severely here, and not just outnumbered, which we'll get to when we get to their uh, composition. The excellent research done by Professor Anne Curry shows that it would have been difficult for the French to field more than 12,000 troops at Agincourt. Furthermore, contemporary French records of military financial expenses for the 1415 campaign show that 6,000 men-at-arms and 3,000 archers were recruited, with additional men assembled in the weeks prior to the battle, 
for a total of around 12,000 troops. Still, the French outnumbered the English up to two to one. But the biggest difference between the two armies was in the numbers of men-at-arms, a five to one ratio in favor of the French. To learn more on this, links to Anne Curry's books and articles from the University of Southampton and Future Learn are in the sources below. I'll put those links down there also, and we're going to get into this numbers now and a lot of other stuff, so prepare yourself. So, as I have mentioned previously, when I say men-at-arms are roughly equivalent to knights, we're now going to talk about that, okay? So, men-at-arms was a general term used for basically someone that's a professional soldier, roughly, okay? Now, these men ranged varyingly in equipment from, you know, the full plate knight that we know today to people in brigandine, which is like plate minus, I guess. Um, it's not really, but I'll give you that a relatively equivalency, okay? But still really good protection. And these guys are professional soldiers. They know what they're doing. They're paid, okay? Now, the uh, that's what men at arms are. They're basically professional soldiers that have really good gear, okay? They're your knights. Um, the 3,000 archers and crossbowmen on the French side and the 5,000 archers on the English side. Let's talk about them. I said think peasants last time, right? It, roughly, because again, it's not really an equivalency. So, archers and crossbowmen, okay, and these 5,000 archers, these people wanted to go on campaign, okay? Maybe not the French ones, but these guys were motivated to go you know, get some loot and stuff. They're not poor. They're not like dirt poor. No, they have enough money, and again, this range is varying with. We have like the poorest dude that has like a longbow and like a quilted jacket with some gambeson and a helmet, right? To all the way to the mounted uh, yeoman longbowman, okay, that has a horse. He's got all the good gear. He's got a good longbow, all the armor and everything, okay? So that's the scale you're working with between the um, English archers, specifically the English, okay? Now, talking about the French, okay, archers and crossbowmen, this is a little different. The French also use longbowmen, professional longbowmen, okay? Not a lot of people know that, but yes, they did. The French saw the value after basically the Battle of Cressy. That, you know, longbows are pretty good, so why not use them? The Kingdom of France is one of the best medieval nations in the military-wise, okay? Everyone dogs on France. I don't see why they do that, but, you know, the World War II performance for some reason, but they failed to look at the previous one. Fr the French army was one of the best medieval armies out there. They had the best knights. Hands down. Fight me. I will fight you on this. They had the best knights, so the best men-at-arms, okay? Um, and their archers were good, okay? They even had the contingents of Scottish ar ar Scotland archers, so Scottish archers that would come work for France because, you know, Scotland and France have a long history of working together against the English, right? So longbows, you know, roughly equivalent to the English, okay? They're pretty good. Now, there's also crossbowmen in here. Genoese crossbowmen, to be specific. These are paid mercenaries from Genoa, or Genoese, you know, Italians, um, that are really good at being, you know, crossbowmen. So Pavis crossbows, they have a big shield, they put it down, they have two to three helpers so that the actual dude, the Genoese dude, is shooting and his helpers are reloading his other two to three crossbow bodies. Okay? Those are really good professional soldiers. And then you have the other 3,000 infantry on top of that, okay? That are, you know, spearmen, levy, whatever, and then they're varying in range of equipment. They also have some artillery that we can show, right? So all of these are contributing factors. They also have the financial records, again, to see that uh showed that uh what is it men at arms showed up at six thousand and then three thousand archers recruited prior plus additional manpower okay there is ridiculous amount of money and equipment on charles side okay for the french side because he's a constable of france marshal of france goes the marshal of france if you watch my uh, napoleon series goes all the way back to this actually which is the marshal of france so constable marshal right marshal of france head military dude really good dude he knows what he's doing okay this whole forest right here should absolutely smash Henry in a one-for-one -one fight, no doubt. 100% should beat him. If you use any tactical legitimacy, any tactical skill, okay? And of course, if again, this is if everyone obeys you, you should not lose this. There should be no way you lose this, right? You have archers to go fight their archers, and then you have way more men-at-arms than them to take the brunt of the beating, okay? But look at the terrain. The terrain is narrow. 
so that these 1,000 men-at-arms that Henry has can fight the French pretty effectively. Because, again, it's a small corridor, just like 300 at Thermopylae, right? Um, this is going to start be compounding, right? Because the French plan wasn't actually to fight here at all, right? They wanted to fight at the other place, where it was open ground, where the cavalry could go around and smash the archers, and the archers would absolutely die. So that's one thing, okay? Um, and before uh, I close this out, just know that the French army was really strong. And now I'm going to go talk about their armor. Okay, so looking at the armor, I put those two images up on your screen. I'm going to talk about those roughly, okay? If you look at your far right, you're going to see that the, um, the 1315 mail and plate, okay? That's the transitional, but we're in 1415. We're not quite to the 1440s level of Gothic armor, but just know that these French knights that are the men-at-arms, okay, the top tier of their men-at-arms, the knights are wearing plate, okay? They have the best gear possible. And then it's a scale. It ranges, okay? Because, um, again, you could still technically use your dad's armor, right? So if you had his armor from, like, 1380 and it's, like, 1415, it would still be pretty good protection, right? But it might not be the full plate you're thinking of. Now, if you look at the top image and then you look at the 1400s, okay, versus the 1330s. So they had a coat of plates at first with chainmail, right? Because chainmail has always been used. Um, basically, what he's wearing on the 1330 image is a coat of plates. What is it? It's basically a little locking of interplates, okay, little plates that protect you. And it's just a big, uh, basically, I think of a throw-on vest is the best way to put it. It's like a throw-on vest that protects your vital organs, okay? Now, that was pretty outdated by this time, but could still show up again. Um, with brigandine uh that's basically that but more modern um for people that didn't want to have the absolute best and again there are some reasons why you wouldn't want to wear a plate where brigandine would do just fine um but again 1400s we're talking full plate harness we're talking breastplate you may have a lower plate on top of that you definitely have a helmet the hound skull helmet that everyone knows that bassinet you have you have you know leg protection you got arm protection at the best equivalency if you look at the 1400 dude that's your best top tier knight okay that can wade through fire at your worst, maybe a 1330, but really not. Like, again, these guys are pretty well equipped. But at worst, probably not full plate, but somewhere near it, okay? That's how armored these guys are on the French side. On the English side, the same thing. These 1,000 men at arms, the exact same thing. They're basically wearing full plate armor at this point, okay? Because, um, again, men at arms roughly knights and then scales all the way down to basically professional soldier okay so i just wanted to point that out as to what these guys are going to be wearing especially the men-at-arms the archers it very roughly varies okay it's gambeson which is basically a quilted jacket that actually offers pretty decent protection against everything um so just know that that the men-at-arms are wearing this and also the genoese crossmen are pretty much wearing uh brigandine so there you go all right back to the video and future learn are in the sources below both armies were fully deployed by 7 a.m., but the standoff continued for another three to four hours. The men hurled insults at each other, but the Constable of France was in no hurry, and Henry was outnumbered. Neither side wanted to make the first move. However, the English were desperately low on food and supplies, while the French were well provisioned, with some of the older nobles suggesting that they should just simply wait and let the English go hungry. And as lunchtime approached around 11 a.m., many French nobles sent their servants to fetch meals, while others mounted their horses to trot around and keep them warm. Seeing that the enemy was willing to wait and starve him out, Henry made a bold decision. So before we get to Henry's decision here, this makes perfect sense from the French perspective, right? Like, go get me a croissant. Croissant or a basquet. Uh, because again, they're next to French town. They literally have French people there. They're like, why don't you just go buy some food? And right? that's what the French are going to go. They're going to go buy some food. And then go, Squire, go get me a croissant. So that's what happens here. And again, they can wait. They can afford to wait. This is their own territory. On top of that, there are also additional reinforcements coming to them. Because remember, all those people that were garrisoning the river beforehand, yeah, they're not all coming here to basically uh, the constable's army. So the French are just continuously building up their strength. So the English are really on the back foot here. They got no food. They're hungry. They're, you know, they, they're unwell. They're, uh, they're unhappy, right? And they have to go through this guy. So, and he's continuously getting reinforcements. He's getting stronger. Henry's getting weaker. 
So he has to do something drastic. He gave the order. Banners forward. Archers pulled their hedgehog of sharpened stakes from the ground and carried them forward to the new battle line. Surprised to see the English line advancing, French divisions began to sort themselves out. Then came Henry's signal for the bowmen hidden in the trees. The two so before we get to that, this is a really risky move, and Henry knows it, and the constable knows it. Henry is betting that the constable won't immediately attack him because he's picking up his stakes, moving his defensive position, and moving it forward to a point where the archers can basically be in effective range. Whatever that is, we don't know. Probably less than like 100 yards, 150 yards. It's not very, I mean, if you shoot a bow 100 yards, like I'm impressed, right? I shot mine at state competition, I think 25 yards. And they, that's actually a pretty far target for me, right? But again, that's what we're thinking of. It's not like 600 something yards, right? That, that's crazy. Um, but he's moving closer to provoke the French to egg them on to attack him. Because again, he needs them to attack him. He, he has a smaller force, right? If he has defensive ground, he has a chance if they attack him. And that's to egg them on. Because again, the French are getting stronger. He's not getting stronger. 200 archers unleashed on the French. With the arrow volleys came the shouting of hunting calls, designed to make it seem like the act of shooting at French nobles was no different than hunting wild hogs in the forest. This was a deep insult for the French nobility, who didn't even recognize the existence of the low-born English archers. It now that snarkiness from the nobility is true to an extent. The French army knew how good the longbows were after the Battle of Cressy, right? Um, they even had longbows here, right? But again, you know, top of the creme de la creme of the French nobility is at this battle, right? With all their best stuff. So getting shot by a peasant with a bow as they saw it was an insult. Enraged, the French were goaded into advancing forward. Just when it seemed that the two armies were charging towards each other, Henry ordered the men to stop once they reached the extreme longbow range, and the archers quickly went about replanting the sharp wooden stakes in front of the line. Now, this is an important distinction, okay? The constable, from what we've heard or seen sources say, he didn't necessarily want to do a frontal attack, but the nobles were egged on. They're like, no, we're going to do a frontal attack, I'm going. So he kind of went with the flow, right? That's why these archers back here, which is important, the archers and crossbowmen that could actually fight one for one, these longbowmen, right, and do some decent damage, were left behind. They just weren't used. The entire battle they weren't used. And then the French, and then the French would retreat from the battle and see these crossbowmen also running, or you know, actually they were just moving into position. And then the French nobility would cut down the noble, uh, the, the Genoese crossbowmen, because. Yeah, of course you would do that. Why, why, would, why would you not kill the mercenary crossbowmen that you have in your army? Because of course, you know, uh, anyway, let's continue. French mounted knights on either flank rode ahead of the main line, tasked with breaking the large contingents of English archers to allow the dismounted heavily armored men-at-arms to close in. However, the plowed muddy field slowed them down and they soon rode into a virtual storm of arrows. English and Welsh archers in Henry's army carried more powerful bows than those used by their forefathers, and the armor-piercing arrowheads made the weapon much deadlier than its predecessor. I would go check out my video on, well, my reaction, or you could actually just go watch Todd Workshop's um, video on the longbow, and especially uh, the version 2. I would highly recommend that, because that plays really legitimately into this battle, okay? Whether they use armor-piercing arrowheads, we, just, we don't know. It's probably not. The, the broadheads we've seen, I mean, they don't do anything. And the copper case hardening, you know, armor-piercing, stronger bows, meh, I wouldn't go so far as to say that. What I would say is that if you watch those videos, and that's the testing we have, that's the best we're going to get, legitimately, um, from the front is basically nigh on impenetrable if you have decently good plate, okay? But the problem is those lucky shots. Not like if it bounces off, you're going to be ringed. If it hits your helmet, it's going to ding. It's going to ring your brain. Okay. On top of that, not only that, the actually, if it dings off and shears off and goes in a different direction, it can 
for example, if you're like the second dude in line, it can sping off your helmet, shoot directly like at a like a 75 degree angle to your front, and then go into the dude's neck in front of you, right? Because that <laughs> ricochet. Now that can lead to a lot of damage, and you're also hunked over, and it's not nice to be getting shot with all these arrows, right? And also the horses aren't armored. Uh, some of them might be, but most of them probably aren't because it's expensive. You shoot the horse, you know, rider goes forward, right? So all these factors compound to why the bow was effective, right? And it just wouldn't, like, if you shot a knight at, like, 10 yards, probably not going to penetrate. But you shoot his arm, right? You shoot his leg. It would definitely going to do some serious damage. And if you shoot in the right place, it'll go through. The arrow volleys cut down many of the knights. Wounded and frightened horses threw their riders and galloped from the fray in panic back towards the main French line, with some crashing into the incoming infantry, trampling over the men-at-arms and breaking their cohesion. Soon enough, the cavalry charge faltered. Most of the survivors fled back, stumbling past their comrades in terror, while a few brave men rejoined the attack. The 1st French Division slogged their way forward through the mud under a constant barrage. Younger, more hot-headed nobles predicted that the English would be struck with fear by the approach of so many knights and men-at-arms. That they were not was the result of the damage that their arrows had caused. By the time the French reached the enemy, they were close to exhaustion, some wounded by arrows. Still, the sheer weight of their numbers pushed the English back, but at a heavy price. Think about the respect of the, of the French men at arms here. So now, they're not only having to fight the, the people in front of them trying to kill them, so if you bring your, like, let's just say you bring your poleaxe, because I love poleaxes, you bring your poleaxe back, right, you're going to hit the dude in front of you, and then you get shot under the armpit, under the, because there's an archer onto your right side firing into you on your right, you get hit in the armpit, you go, oh, and then the dude in front of you kills you, right? Or you're in the back, of these guys and you're just continuously getting hit with arrows on the side so you go like turn this way then you get hit back here so that's why the english are like it's why it is very important that the english are spread out and shooting them in the sides and the back because that really will um go through the armor many french men-at-arms shortened their lances in anticipation of quickly closing in on the english shorter weapons would have given them an advantage in close quarters but now the English had a longer reach, jabbing at the less protected legs and groin of the advancing French. Those mortally wounded fell, and others piled up on top of them, many still alive who simply fell in the crush. The second French division straggled into the fight, but this only made matters worse. Pressing the first division from the back failed to add any momentum to the attack and only caused more confusion in the ranks. With the English line stretched thin, archers dropped their bows and joined the melee, pulling out their swords, axes, hammers, and daggers to add to the defense of the line. And maces. And this is very important, okay? The archers are also, as soon as you shoot all of your arrows, what are you going to do? No, you're not going to withdraw. No, you need to get into the fight, right? The English don't have the men-at-arms to hold the line. So that when, the, when the arrows are gone, you grab whatever you have and you get in there and surround the French men-at-arms, and then it's, it's basically a slaughter now. The line. Being more lightly armored, the bowmen maneuvered their way in the mud much easier, cutting straight into the enemy formation. With no reserves to speak of, King Henry himself took part in the fighting, as the mauling of the French men-at-arms continued, with many captured for ransom after the encounter. And the funny thing about Henry, actually, he he literally wore the crown, like the King of France crown, and moved up and was like a big target. Like he had gold plate armor, and he was like, "Hey, come kill me!" That he was goading the French nobility into coming to like take him down and kill him. Right? That's what his armor was representing. So he was actually in the fight majority of the time. And it's not like the English like our, our light armor helped. Them. I mean, it's good to be less armored because you drag less of the Calais mud onto you, right? Um, but it's not like if you wore less armor, you were, you know, better fighter or whatever, because the king gets that wrong in the Netflix show, and I just want to point that out. It's not like they wore less armor. No, they wore equivalent armor. It's just that the English longbow guys couldn't wear the full thing because they couldn't because they're archers. Within two hours, both sides ran out of steam, and the battle was decided. Those French who survived staggered back towards the uncommitted 3rd French Division, 
now uncertain if they should join the fighting. As the English were catching their breath, a local French lord appeared behind the English line, leading a group of knights and a mob of peasants. Perhaps their plan was to attack Henry's rear, but they soon descended on the English camp, capturing the king's beddings and one of his spare crowns. Unsure if the French would regroup and he would become trapped between two enemy contingents, Henry ordered the slaughter of prisoners to prevent them from joining a possible third French attack. And this is remembered to the day, okay? Because, I mean, if you were a peasant, no, you were killed. It doesn't matter. What are you worth? Nothing. But if you are a noble, which a lot of these men at arms were, like a, no a noble from lesser house all the way to the noblest houses, depends how much money you can get out of them. That's why if you surrendered, they took you and you had chivalry and all that other stuff. Yeah, blah, 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 blah. Reality was they could get a lot of money out of you if they didn't kill you. So that's why they took you prisoner instead of, you know, murdering you. Because you're worth a lot of money. Because your family will pay a lot of money for you. Or you will pay a lot of money for you and you can go back home. And we get all of their money. So that's uh, why ransoming was prevalent through the medieval times. But Henry <laughs> ordered to kill these guys because, again, he didn't know if they would disobey. Because, again... There's a lot of prisoners they took here, and they didn't know if they would start picking up weapons and trying to kill them, because they easily could have, right? So he had them executed, which is a dark day, Europe, because we literally still remember it today. It was non-kosher to do this. Let's put it that way. It's remembered to this day as a bleak event because it's non-kosher. Now, it's not like this didn't happen. It just didn't happen all the time. And it's like meant to be a disdain to Henry, right? It did happen, right? On medieval battlefields where you kill all the nobles because and kill all the people, it happened. But usually you didn't do that. So that's why I would like to point it out. As the systematic killing of prisoners unfolded, Henry sent a herald to the 3rd French Division, ordering them off the battlefield. The 3rd French line withdrew from the field soon after. On the English side, Casualties are thought to have been no greater than 600. Earl of Suffolk died, as did the Duke of York, trampled to death in the mud. Henry himself defended his badly wounded brother, the Duke of Gloucester, in the heat of battle. Meanwhile, on the French side, five grave pits were dug, each filled with between 1,000 and 1,200 dead. Around 5,000 perished, though this number may have been higher. We just don't know. They had to dig mass pits there. Like the the constable of France was a casualty, <laughs> right? John Duke of Alcillon and Marshal Boudicard, the Marshal, right, died in captivity four years later, right? But they had a lot of captives here. Like this was a pivotal battle in this uh, war, I guess you'd call it. The constable of France died in the fighting. So did the Duke of Alençon, as well as Boucicault, along with many prominent knights and nobles. This most incredible of triumphs had put the Kingdom of France on its knees. The capture of Harfleur and the victory at Agincourt made Henry V a national hero in a kingdom only beginning to feel as a nation. In just a few short weeks, Henry had risen to become the diplomatic arbiter of Europe getting a visit from the King of Hungary, later the Holy Roman Emperor Sigismund in 1416, with whom he entered into an alliance that would serve him well. Later he returned to France to realize his plan of conquering Normandy. Rouen, the capital of northern France, surrendered in 1419. Later that same year, the murder of Duke John the Fearless secured him a Burgundian alliance. These successes forced the French to agree to terms outlined in the Treaty of Troyes in 1420, recognizing Henry as the heir to the French throne and regent of France. Catherine, King Charles' daughter, was married to him. Still a young king, he was now at the height of his power. But uh, Before we get to what actually happened to Henry, think about that. That one battle changed the course of history. I mean, it's a course of medieval history for him, right? He literally has Paris under English control now. And, you know, Burgundy uh, is allied with him. And again, this is like 1422. This is not even, what, seven years later, right? You can't rebuild everything that was lost. There. It was a massive amount of people and equipment lost 
at the Battle of Agincourt absolutely decimated the French Royal Army. If you would call it that, you know, the French Royal Army at this time. Um, absolutely just demolished at that battle. He was now at the height of his power, but these triumphs would not last as his health deteriorated during the sieges of Moulin and Meaux. Aged only 36, he died at the Chateau of Vincennes in 1422, likely of dysentery. Credit goes to our awesome pe And uh, yeah, I don't think he was able to sire a kid by that point, but I'll look that up in a minute here. Uh, I'll go look that up right now, see if he had a kid. Yeah, so he had one kid <laughs> that would become Henry VI and was aged nine months old, okay? So that should put that into perspective of um, how <laughs> in, uh, what is it, uh, unstable his kingdom would become, right? Because this is one of the closest times that England and France could have actually been a united kingdom, but his son um, by Catherine, um, I believe, would have been uh, would have inherited the title of Kingdom of France, which he did. He, fun fact, he did inherit the kingdom. Um, disputed by the French, of course. Um, but that's a thing. So, there you go. Alright, so that's the end in the Battle of Agincourt. So hopefully you guys like that uh, breakdown feature, whatever thing you want to call this, and uh, hopefully I'll see you next time. You can click here for another video. Otherwise, I'll see people next time. Adios.